The job of the blender is to combine these elements in such a way as to produce an overall flavor. A wider repertoire of different beverages than ever before. So I think one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia. Single malts, blends, grain whiskies, bourbons and more. If you want my style to be sold around the world, then unfortunately you're going to have to make a compromise. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Sports writers don't generally win a James Beard Culinary Award. It's like Lionel Messi winning an Oscar. But that's exactly what my next guest, Baxter Holmes, has done. In fact, he's the only sports writer thus far to have achieved this singular honour for his article about the humble peanut butter and jelly sandwich and its unlikely rise to pre-match secret weapon for the NBA. Baxter is the national NBA writer for ESPN, focusing on features, projects, and anything else of interest in the world of basketball. Recently, he has found himself becoming increasingly fascinated with what the players do away from the court. In the process, he unearthed a fantastic story about the NBA's growing obsession with wine. Players, it seems, have moved beyond the usual trappings of wealth, houses, cars, bling, etc., and are instead turning their attention and sizable incomes to a more unusual pursuit, wine. Surprisingly, this is not merely a story of bragging rights over who can buy the most expensive bottle. These NBA stars, including LeBron James, have developed a genuine interest in wine. They want to know about it intimately, develop their palates, and speak knowledgeably about wine. Some have even taken a giant leap and purchased their own vineyards. So stay with me in this opening episode of Drinks Adventures Season 10, as Baxter reveals how he embarked on his investigation into the NBA's burgeoning wine obsession. Yeah, so I think this is 2017, and I just I started to notice on social media and in some interviews that there had been more and more NBA players who were posting about wine, posting about trips to wine tasting regions, uh, uh, mentioning, you know, wanting to have wine um, at team dinners or after a game, they would reference how they were looking forward to wine, and it just. I, I, I was curious at that point if there was some kind of movement that was happening. And so I asked my editors if I could look into it. And I, one of the things that I tried to be mindful of at that point was if there were, if, if players were just, you know, people with a lot of money were buying expensive things. I don't think that's necessarily interesting. And I don't think it's necessarily interesting to a large audience, but it seemed, um, and I was curious, I, I was curious if this was the case, that there was like a genuine um, interest, a want to learn, a, a um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the word is, but a real genuine drive to try to uh, know and, and know wine, speak about wine, or, you know, understand wine on a very deep level. And uh, so that's what I was interested in. And sure enough, in some of my initial interviews with people um, in the wine community who had served players um, and interacted with them on that front. That was one of the first things they mentioned that, you know, they would get people of um, uh, certainly of means who could afford any bottle on any list, but they didn't necessarily care about learning about wine or understanding wine or wanting to really, you know, get to the bottom of how a great bottle comes to be, uh, but that the players were different. And so that really, that started it for me. Um, I didn't know anything about wine at the time um, that, that changed through the course of the reporting for the story. But yeah. And I think the initial story I want to say came out in like early 2018. Um, and I've done a couple more stories kind of about the wine food world in the NBA since then, but I've, I've, and certain, certainly since that time, I've seen more players who have started their own wine labels or, um, you know, things, things of that nature. So it's definitely, it's definitely picked up a lot. It's, it seems like in the past few years. Was there any particular catalyst that started the trend? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I remember during the course of my initial reporting, being very curious about that myself, you know, was, was there a particular moment that started this? And 
the thing that I came to realize in you know conversations with a lot of people in all kinds of fields across the country and, and certainly throughout the NBA was it's really was kind of a culmination of things. Like one thing, for instance, that helped drive it was there were so, there are so many more international players in the NBA um, and have been certainly over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. And players certainly from regions uh, such as Australia, such as Spain, Italy, France, absolutely, um, areas in South America that are very, uh, you know, wine is very much a part of the of the culture, a part of the dinner table. And them coming into the NBA and, and bringing that aspect of their culture to a lot of team dinners and, and so forth, I think helped push it. You have, you know, gentlemen like uh, Greg Pop. Popovich, the San Antonio Spurs head coach, who is kind of renowned for his knowledge of food and wine and and uh, for team dinners that he, these extravagant kind of team dinners that he helps orchestrate. He's been a key part of it. Um, another aspect I would mention too is, you know, there are several well-known, um, I would say like uh, people in the music industry, you know, guys like Jay-Z, um, especially in Drake, who are very into wine there. And they're also very deeply, closely connected with uh, the NBA, and I think they, they have helped. You know, some of these connections with with the music world have helped push it. Um, and another thing I would mention too is that there has been a movement over, you know, again the last ten to fifteen years of uh, more players investing in post career things. Um, and namely, I would say the tech industry, especially uh, while they're still in their career. So they've been spending a lot of time in the Bay Area. And that's, you know, there's a lot of wine country up there. They're going to dinners with people. Um, and there's, I'm sure, plenty of wine on the table. And that has helped push it along. So, and, and, and last but not least, I would say that when certain star players, guys like LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony and Chris Paul, the leaders of the locker room, if you will, are into wine, it really helps. You know, the, the rest of the locker room uh, is going to be pushed in that direction as well, so to speak. Like, their player, other players are going to want to know how to speak about wine well, understand different regions, different vintages, different producers. And, you know, I, I think you don't want to necessarily be left out at the table uh, if the wine list is passing your hands and not being able to know how to navigate it um, thoughtfully. Um, or if there's like some kind of gathering and somebody, you know, there's a theme of what kind of bottles to bring. You don't want to, you know, you, you want to measure up, so to speak. So, yeah, it's it's been a culmination of things, but it is it is. All of it, you know, kind of a perfect storm has brought us to this point. Is there an element of competitiveness then between the players over, you know, who who knows the most or who has the best seller and that kind of stuff? I think so. Um, I mean, look, these are incredibly competitive. It's an incredibly incredible uh, or competitive uh, group of individuals as it is. And that extends to all kinds of, you know, different walks of life. Certainly, you know, you see it in uh, fashion. You know, the, the the kind of the, the walk into the arena pregame, the pregame fits, as they call it, trying to wear, um, you know, have the best kind of ensemble of, of clothing. And, you know, it could be in cars, it can be in jewelry, it could be, you know, you name it. Um, and even competitiveness when it comes to uh, things off the court uh, with, with respect to, um, you know, different production companies or media companies, what have you, or trying to start their own. So, yeah, it, act, it absolutely, I think there's competitiveness in this. Um, and I also think, but but I would say that it's not just about like who can afford the biggest and most expensive trophy wine, because I mean, let's be honest, they all pretty much can. There's, I don't think there's a wine on any list that they're not going to be able to afford. But I think in being able to understand um, the nuances of wine and, you know, maybe uh, like what, you know, what pairs well best with what, or like I said, being able to navigate a list thoughtfully. Um, I, there's, I think there's definitely a healthy competitiveness there. And I, and look, I just think in general that for a lot of these guys, the competitiveness is the switch that can't be turned off. I don't, you know, I don't, <laughs> there's probably not an arena, um, or, or walk of life that they're in, uh, that they aren't competitive. And, and I'm sure, sure that that's especially true in, in a locker room team setting, whatever. It's just, it's who they are. It's wired into their very beings. What would have been the drink of choice for N NBA players generally after a game prior to, to wine? 
Yeah, prior to wine, I mean, uh, and you hear stories about this in the in the seventies, the eighties, even the nineties. You know, it was it was things like beer and liquor, uh, different spirits. You know, um, certainly in the seventies and the eighties, you know, you'd hear stories of like guys like Larry Bird and others that they were big into things like Budweiser or or whatever. You know, I remember once player, I think I put it in that twenty eighteen story, but he recounted to me even as recently as his rookie year, which was in the mid two thousands, of walking down. Um, the team plane or the aisle on the, on the team flight. And you'd see like beer or different spirits in guys hands. But now he said, it's all wine. Um, you know, so yeah, it, there, there's, there's been a big shift in that front. And uh, I've, I haven't certainly heard as many stories about beer um, or different kind of spirits, whether it's, uh, and, and certainly the spirits, you know, that would vary depending on certain guys, where they're from or what they're into, you know, but yeah, it's wine is the dominant is is the dominant beverage of choice after games for sure. And what styles of wine are uh, people enjoying? Does that really depend on who we're talking about? Whether they're enjoying you know champagne or old world wines or going deep on on you know Napa Valley or, or you know which which sort of styles would you say are, are the most popular? Yeah, it's interesting, and I think some of the some of the answers I'm going to give you. Um, I mean, certainly it varies person to person, but there are certain trends that you notice. And just as a lot of people, I think um, uh, if maybe I'm describing the average kind of American journey through wine, you know, of, of at least this is what some players told me. And I've talked to different people of wine. They said, yeah, that's kind of the typical path, but you know, you, you might start out with a, a, cause wine can be intimidating. It's endless. It's, it's old as, as civilization itself. Um, you know, there's so many reasons and things to know and things to, try to pronounce that looked really intimidating. Um, so I think a lot of people's introduction, you know, can be like a sweeter wine, like a Riesling, you know, a sweet Riesling or something like that. Um, and they're like, oh, that tastes pretty good. And then eventually they kind of get on a California kick and it can be a lot of more modern, younger, big reds, Napa cabs type of things. And eventually someone will introduce them to old world wine. And they might first make kind of the trek over to Bordeaux. Um, and then eventually someone might introduce them to Burgundy, Northern Rhone, um, uh, you know, different Barolos, Barbarescos, things of that nature, white Burgundy, certainly. And then that's kind of where a lot of the, you know, the guys live. But so I, I say that to say that like some younger players who are just kind of starting out, you can kind of see that they're in the, the California part of their journey. Um, some of the older players, guys like Carmelo Anthony, they are, you know, Burgundy, um, you know, more, they, they, they live more in the old world. Um, you know, guys like JJ Redick, who's been into this for a while and has done it at a pretty high level, you know, he's into, you know, great Barolo, great Burgundy, uh, both white and red, you know, great Northern Rhone, like Keller Riesling, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, <laughs> the high end stuff that people with a lot of nuance that people who've been into wine for a while really appreciate and enjoy drinking that day these days. But uh, yeah, it does. It certainly does vary. You know, I see younger players who are drinking things like current release, silver Oak, current release, Camus, um, stuff like that. And then veterans guys who've been into it for a while have, have kind of made their way towards the old world and are drinking some of that other stuff. It is also fun to see, you know, last little thing on this, some of the guys, who have been into wine for a world um, for a bit will go back to the California um, side of it, but they will they, they get into the old school Napa Valley. So they're wanting to drink like old, you know, old Ridge Montebello, old uh, Louis Martini cabs, old Heights Martha, you know, old Mayacamas um, from the seventies, like real classic, some of the best wine that America's ever produced. Um, stuff like that, but it's definitely a journey for a lot of people. Um, and it's, you know, it's their own pathway, but you definitely notice trends, uh, even in the league. You mentioned, I think in your original article that LeBron is apparently a, a pretty talented taster, um, and, and, you know, has really deep knowledge, but he doesn't like talking about it to, to media. Yeah. I think it's something that he, you know, he, he's very, he's certainly very passionate about it. And if you follow him on social media, you know, particularly Instagram, you'll see plenty of photos of certain bottles that he is enjoying. And I know from people who have had dinner with him and interacted with him in kind of wine settings that he is 
um, very, very, um, I don't want to say thirsty for knowledge because that's like, that's a bad pun. I want to stay away from that. But he is, <laughs> he, but he's incredibly engaging and he's, he's incredibly curious. And, you know, I've had colleagues who've done stories over the years that, I mean, one of the things, like, if you look at LeBron, just if, like, he was standing in front of you, you would be overwhelmed by his, you know, size and his his speed, his athleticism. Like he is uh, one of my friends put it to me once. Like if you were going to build a basketball player, if you were like you know God and we're going to build a basketball player, LeBron James is probably what you'd come up with. Um, but it kind of the physical nature of him, like the the the, the guy who he is you don't really see his intellect if you were just looking at it at first glance, but he's really one of the smartest players probably to ever play in the NBA, regardless of his athletic gifts and his size and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we've done stories about him having like a, a photographic memory and just like, you know, brilliant recall um, and all these other things, like just having kind of a supercomputer. So that's the first thing I would say about him is like, he's a really, really, really intelligent and very, very gifted on that front. And I, and, and has a great curiosity. And, and when he applies that in anything, I think, um, you know, he, he's probably going to get a lot more out of it than maybe some people just because of the, those abilities. And I've heard that that's very much the case with wine. Like he is, you know, just from following some of his pictures, it's also been interesting to see, um, you know, he's not just posting like DRC or certain, you know, or Loire or certain, or like screaming Eagle or, you know, bottles like that, that are, kind of break the bank trophy wines, you know, like he's drinking interesting um, Chardonnay from Oregon or, you know, different um, producers from the old world that I think people in wine would be like, Oh yeah, that's a really good producer. Probably doesn't get as much hype as it should, but like people who know wine know what that is. And it's kind of a, you know, a, a tip of the cap. So, you know, I, I, yeah, he is, he's, he is, Someone, but he also knows, and this kind of gets to the the latter part of your question. He knows that if he was to mention a certain kind of wine, or whatever the case may be, how big his the megaphone is, like how many followers he has on social media, how much his word kind of carries. I mean, I've heard stories of when he'll post a certain picture of a certain wine on his social media, like the traffic to the, that winery's website will spike, and they'll have a ton <laughs> of orders for that particular vintage. And that particular bottle. So, you know, he, he's, he knows that and he tries to be mindful of it. And, you know, um, but yeah, he is, uh, he's definitely, I, I think, you know, I've said before that Carmelo is the one who amongst players probably knows the most because he's, he's been into it for a long time and he too is very smart, very passionate about it. But, um, you know, LeBron, LeBron is up there. There's no doubt about it. You mentioned Screaming Eagle, which is another link uh, with NBA as well, because it's Stan Kroenke, isn't it, who who owns Screaming Eagle as well as the Denver Nuggets? Yeah, yeah, and um, and uh, you know Carmelo Anthony was there uh, playing under him, and I had heard that there had been some interactions with um, our Carmelo and Stan in terms of like talking wine and things of that nature, which I'm sure is true. Uh, but in my conversations with Carmelo, you know, he described that his wine, um, his wine knowledge and everything kind of really blew up when he was in New York and was, it like started in Denver, but it really kind of blew up in New York when he was meeting with different collectors, um, and so forth. I, I will say that, uh, it, it, it's been interesting over the last, I don't know, a few years, you, you learn about the different connections of people in wine, to the NBA. Um, and it really just speaks to how much wine is connected to anything. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's probably not an industry that it doesn't touch. Um, you know, the NBA is certainly high profile. There's a lot of people with, you know, huge social media followings and, you know, very avid fan base and so on. But, uh, the amount of, of, you know, I mean, you could throw, I've, I've been at tables with, all kinds of different walks of life and wine was the thing that brought them there. And I think that, uh, that's, that's true in sports. A lot of people, sports brings a lot of different kinds of people together, but I haven't encountered anything, you know, that brings people together quite like the way wine does and coming to the table for dinner and whatnot. It's certainly older than sports itself. And, uh, 
you know, everybody's got to eat. And in a lot of cultures, when you come to the table, there's wine on the table. So it's pretty ubiquitous. Has it helped, you know, drive consumption by younger consumers in America and and people of colour as well? Because I've read, you know, people talk about how the wine industry has largely failed to to market to African-American consumers, which is a huge market. Um, and has the, has the NBA's enthusiasm for wine, has, has it helped in that regard at all? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, the thing that I know is that, and I, from talking to different, um, if it's importers, if it's uh, winemakers, you know, just various folks in the wine world, they have described how the NBA with its megaphone has helped introduce wine to a much larger audience that, isn't necessarily familiar with it, but they see their favorite player or their favorite team. You know, if they're going out to wine dinners or their favorite players posting more pictures about wine, it's helped introduce them to an audience that, you know, like me, once upon a time was kind of intimidated by the vastness and, you know, the the basically endless um, uh, nature of wine, you know, that it is. So they've definitely helped introduce it. Now, as to the you know, the specific segments of the population that has introduced it to, I guess it would make sense, but I can't speak to that necessarily. I don't know if more African-Americans are drinking wine um, because, you know, certain NBA players or just the NBA in general is more wine forward or kind of public about wine, but I, it certainly wouldn't surprise me. I don't, uh, you know, when I, when I look at the follower counts of, like say LeBron and Chris Paul and Carmelo and Dwayne Wade and the number of players who have started their own wine labels, guys like, you know, Steph Curry or CJ McCollum, uh, just, you know, or Dwayne Wade. I would be hard pressed uh, to think that they haven't helped push wine forward in all kinds of areas of the population that, that it, you know, wine was something that maybe wasn't there for them before, but now they're interested in it. They, they want to know what their favorite players drinking. They want to feel like they're, you know, like they too can go to a restaurant, navigate a wine list or post about wine or, you know, try a certain wine that a, a player that they enjoy watching or, you know, are big fans of has also enjoyed that. Maybe it probably helps in some ways, maybe make that connection feel a little bit, you know, more real to know you're drinking the same kind of wine that they are. I know that wineries, again, they've talked about selling out of, um, certain kind of bottles that players have posted um, and whatnot. So I'm sure that some of that's there. I I wouldn't, yeah, I I believe that. And you wrote last year about how, you know, when the players had to go into a bubble uh, to to continue playing the season, you know, how one of the most important considerations for them was how to get good wine in there and, and, you know, wine fridges and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, um, I I saw that some players at kind of posted about some pictures of wine that they had had there. Um, but you don't, you know, I don't, it's such an extraordinary situation, right? You don't really know. And it wasn't until I eventually connected with the people who were overseeing, uh, they had kind of turned it a warehouse. It was kind of like a, an, a hotel ballroom where they were getting somewhere between like 700 and 1200 packages a day. And they were referring to, and they, I said, well, what's the thing you see the most? Like what kind of packages come the most? And they said, it's wine, you know, wine fridges, stemware, Cases of wine, certainly. Um, and the thing that I, I, you know, some people could just interpret that as like, oh, these guys are there and they're just ordering tons of wine. But in my conversations with with players and others who were there, uh, the thing that they emphasized the most was like the isolation, right? So, you know, I think maximum, it was like three months that a lot of people were there, couldn't really leave, very restrictive. You were, there was a time period when they could have friends or family there, but it was a limited amount. And I remember talking to one player and he said, you know, we're in our hotel rooms for like 12 hours a day, upwards of, and uh, there's a period at night when they could, you know, from a distance sit in a kind of dining setting um, around other players or other people. And to be able to like open the bottle and have a glass from however many feet away and actually have human interaction and conversation was really needed given the extraordinary circumstances, what was going on, not only the pandemic, but, you know, um, I think the, the George Floyd killing and the social justice movement and everything that had been going on. So being able, you know, as we talked about before, like wine, bringing people together, I think 
given how far they were apart, this was one of the few aspects of normalcy um, that they could control and during, you know, again, a pretty extraordinary situation. And I don't want to say that it was like, this is bringing about sanity, but it was bringing about a, a sense of mental comfort, um, which people there had told me was like much needed and under everything that was going on. And a lot of that, you know, to no surprise to a lot of people uh, was happening. You know, I was going to say like around a table, it was obviously socially distanced and there's various guidelines and protocols they had to follow. But yeah, there was plenty of wine that was um, being had there and appreciated. And and I also think it was a circumstance where various players who were into wine, but were on different teams and you don't, you don't see other, you know, you only see certain teams like once or twice a year and you don't maybe get substantive time around each other. I think it was a chance for certain people in the NBA who were really into wine to get to be around each other and maybe share a bottle and talk about wine. And it provides a little bit of an escape. You seem to get a lot of latitude to really explore in depth, you know, some interesting topics that are that are related to the NBA. And, you know, you must be the only sports writer who's who's won a James Beard Award. <laughs> I Well, to that point, which is a, a weird fact, I am the only sports writer to win one or the only I, technically I think the term is like sports media person, uh, which is a um, a heck of a thing. I still don't, I can't believe that that's real. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I, I've, you know, I'm a senior NBA writer for us. I focus on in-depth stories, features, investigations, whatnot. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to find stories that are often away from the court uh, that are often, um, you know, things that are bigger than basketball that kind of, you know, there's a way that they connect to broader um, swaths of society, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, work with some great editors and and I'm fortunate to have the time and resources at ESPN to dig into a lot of these stories. You know, as I said, like, you know, before with the wine, I didn't know anything about wine. You know, I did. I interviewed, I don't know, more than 50, 75 people for that story, traveled to a lot of different cities. Um and tried to learn as much as I can and asked a lot of people who I interviewed, a lot of experts in wine who work on wine, a bunch of the most rudimentary questions you could imagine in order to try to not sound like an idiot while I'm writing about it. Because just as I think wine was certainly daunting to a lot of people to get into, it was certainly daunting for me to write about because I didn't want to look like an idiot either. And it sparked a passion for yourself, I gather, in, in wine as well that you're still kind of exploring. Yeah, it has been, it has been a, a very fun thing. Um, to to continue to learn about, to continue to meet people through, you know, I and to go back to like the kind of people that, you know, like it brings to the table. I think one of the first wine dinners I was at, um, the gentleman to my left was an LAPD homicide detective. The gentleman right across from me was one of the lead sound mixers, if not the lead sound mixer for Lucasfilm. So like, you know, basically in charge of the sound for Star Wars. And the woman to his uh, left was, she um, was either directly in charge of, or uh, was one of the people who was in charge of the Mars Rover for, uh, from the, and, and kind of piloting it around from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Southern California. And they, and I, I would never get a chance to, to interact with these people kind of otherwise. And it was amazing, you know, like over the course of a few hours, you know, talking with them about, you know, being in charge of like this, the most, the best sound in the world or piloting a robot in outer space or solving murders, you know, and they thought that the fact that I wrote about the NBA was fascinating. And I, so, it, and there's been a lot more circumstances like that. You know, I've, I've been fortunate to meet a lot of di different kinds of really interesting people, um, you know, including many people throughout the NBA. So it's, it's something that brings a lot of people together. Um, and I've been, fortune to learn about it. I also, you know, the stories and wine, um, not to sound cliche, but like I, I love storytelling very much. And there's a lot of great stories throughout the history of wine. You know, I finished, um, trying to remember at some point this past year, the book, uh, Wine and War, uh, which is about um, wine during World War II. And fascinating book. I'm, I'm, I love uh, history, not fish and history, and, um, just in general, particularly during that period. And I learned a lot that I wouldn't have known otherwise. So, yeah, it's been a fun passion um, to kind of be interested in. Um, in some ways, it can be an escape at times. You know, I've 
it, it, uh, learning about certain kind of things after, you know, a day of making phone calls for um, a story or, you know, whatever the case may be, it's, you know, not a bad thing. So yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun and, and definitely um, it feels endless um, in terms of like trying to learn. Um, but that also keeps it interesting. Fantastic. Well, Baxter, thanks so much for joining us for a chat about these, these really interesting developments in the NBA. Absolutely, man. My pleasure. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.